TII item 437, August 9th, 2017, iOS 11, Beta 5. Welcome to Today in iPhone. Yeah, I like it a lot. Today in iPhone. Hey, Gola! Oh, yeah. My beautiful iPhone, which I never have out of my hand and that I do everything with and has become an extension of who I am. Today's episode is brought to you by Link AKC, which is an amazing new dog collar that has a GPS locator, fitness tracker, and more. Go to linkakc.com and use promo code TII for additional savings with free shipping. This episode is sponsored by Bowl and Branch. Go right now to bowlandbranch.com and use promo code TII to get $50 off the nicest sheets and cotton products you have ever owned. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Rob, and you are listening to the Today in iOS podcast. First up, I want to thank Tom for sending in the artwork for today's show. Tom wrote the following. Hi, Rob. This is a brand new Apple store in the Avalon Outdoor Mall. It replaced the store in the North Point Mall. Alpharetta is a northern suburb of Atlanta. I use Snap Markup to add the text. Regards, Tom M. Well, thanks, Tom, for sending in this artwork. And folks, you can see Tom's artwork in the free TI app via the bonus button for episode 437 or at Instagram.com slash todayinios, and also Facebook.com slash todayinios. Tom's picture continues to celebrate the 10-year anniversary of TII on the iPhone. Please, when taking a picture of yourself in front of your local Apple store, or one you have to be visiting on a trip, if possible, take a square picture, as I have to make them square for iTunes, and put the Apple store location on the photo, along with TII or Today in iOS branding. Thanks to the many of you that have already sent in photos, as always, send those pics to todayinios at gmail.com. And if you have some music you've created on your iOS device that you would like to share with the audience, please email that to me at the same email address and make sure to include which app or apps you use to create said music. Apple had their quarterly report last week. And how did Apple do? In a nutshell, pretty darn well. They were expected to report revenue between $43.5 billion and $45.5 billion dollars. And they actually reported $45.4 billion, right at the top of their guidance and above Wall Street's estimate of $44.9 billion. A year ago, in the same quarter, Apple reported $42.4 billion, so back on the right track for growth quarter over, or year-over-year quarters. Total cash now is at $261.5 billion, with a B, dollars. That was up $4.7 billion for the quarter. This, after Apple returned $11.7 billion to investors, with $7.2 billion of that paid out in dividends and $4.5 of that billion in stock buybacks. Apple announced the next dividend of $0.63 cents per share will be paid on August 17th to owners of Apple stock as of August 14th. Apple sold 41 million iPhones last quarter versus 40.4 million in the year-ago quarter. Not much of an increase, but still an increase not many were predicting. Apple sold a surprising 11.4 million iPads, up from 10 million in the year-ago quarter. That was a really big surprise for many of the analysts that were covering Apple, as I don't think any of them were really predicting, well, not many were predicting any increase. It was the first significant uptick for iPad sales year over year for the past few years. Apple sold uh, 4.3 million Macs, the same exact, pretty much the same exact number as they did in the year-ago quarter. This all meant that total revenue was at the very top of the guidance and a 7% increase year over year. All time, Apple has now sold over 1.2 billion iPhones and well over 1.6 billion iOS devices. And I say well over because we really don't know how many iPod touches they've ever sold, but we do know iPads and iPhones are over 1.6 billion, so we're looking well over 1.6 billion iOS devices, probably closer I would guess, probably closer to the 1.8 billion range. Apple said Apple Watch sales were up over 50% in the June quarter. One assumes Apple meant 50% increase year over year, but Apple did not say if that was year over year or quarter over quarter. Tim Cook said AirPods have a 98% satisfaction with users and Apple is still not producing at the level of demand and is currently capacity constrained, but working on it which they've been working on it since, well, they released the AirPods. All of this good news leads to Apple stock price moving up since the conference call to record all-time highs. 
it was a combo of good news for the past quarter and positive projections for the future. For the current quarter that we're in, Apple's projecting $49 billion on the low end to $52 billion for revenue on the high end. This is for the quarter ending at the end of September, September 30th. This is an increase in projected revenue year over year and above most analyst projections of what they thought Apple was going to project. And that really does point strongly towards the next iPhone, major new iPhone, launching and shipping prior to the end of September. Apple will be very, very hard-pressed to hit the, their estimates if they do not have at least one solid week of iPhone sales for the next-gen iPhones. And if Apple is announcing three new iPhones, with the upper-end device being the oft-rumored super-duper do-everything-for-everyone iPhone 8, then it, too, will need to ship in September. Apple current quarter, which uh, is the last one for their fiscal year 2017, again, will end on Saturday, September 30th. That means the iPhone 8, with the new iPhone 7S and 7S Plus, if they're going to be three announced, would need to start shipping on Friday, September 22nd. That also means iOS 11 would go gold master on Wednesday, September 20th. And Apple will have their special event likely on Tuesday, September 12th. Could be Wednesday, September 6th, but I think Tuesday the 12th would work. Pre-orders on Thursday, September 14th. That all sounds like a possible calendar. I, I'm sure a couple of those dates are off a little bit. But again, from the guidance for this quarter's revenue, those dates make the most sense for Apple to hit its goals. To recap, most likely dates would be Tuesday, September 12th, special iPhone fall event. Thursday, September 14th, iPhone 8 and 7S and 7S Plus go on sale for pre-order. Wednesday, September 20th, iOS 11 goes live as Goldmaster for the public. Friday, September 22nd, new iPhones start shipping to customers. Saturday, September 30th, end of the current fiscal quarter. That is not based on any inside sources, just common sense and a calendar. Pretty much every article about Apple's current guidance says the only way Apple hits those numbers is with a new iPhone 8 launching around September 22nd, giving Apple a full week of sales. And none thought Apple could hit those numbers with just a refresh of the iPhone 7 and 7 Plus, which at this point would be the fourth generation of that basic design. Nope. They all, after the call, said it would take the iPhone 8 with a week plus of sales to get there. I know I've asked this before, but does ZDNet ever write a good article about Apple? The latest Apple Bash article from ZDNet is about pricing of the iPad, which they said the reason for the uptick last quarter was all about Apple lowering the price. It was one of those we told you so type articles and that basically the told you so was about Apple pricing the iPads too high. Well, if it's all about the price holding back the iPad, Explain how Apple has eight of the 10 best-selling tablets. Would not only the lower-priced units do well in sales if it was all about price? From Apple's quarterly call, quote, NPD indicates that iPad had 55% shares of the U.S. tablet market in the month of June, including eight of the 10 best-selling tablets. That's up from 46% share a year ago. And among tablets priced over $200, Apple's share was 89%. In addition, the most recent survey from 451 research measured business and consumer satisfaction rates ranging from 95% to 99% across iPad models. And among those buy, planning to buy tablets, purchase intent for the iPad was over 70%, unquote. Again, eight of the 10 bestsellers, and all well, well over $200, and many multiple times that, just don't get why ZDNet does not get, it's not all or even mostly about price. But sure, yes, we would always like the lower prices, and maybe that's a little bit of the uptick, but that's not all of it. On Monday, the 7th of August, Apple released iOS 11 Beta 5 to devs. 
and its sister release of the beta to the public, beta testers, was on Tuesday the 8th. This was a shock to no one. The fifth beta is the magic number that I use for when I put it on my main device, and that is what I did this past week. I am now running iOS 11 beta 5 on my iPhone 7 Plus. Most of the beta 5 is about bug fixes from previous beta reports, but most is not all, and there are some changes, tweaks in beta 5. A bunch of icon updates, I will not bore you with those or bore me with those. 3D touching, a control center icon that lacks an action, simulates a tap. Ooh. New play pause button in the control center music controls. A new source icon in the control center navigates straight to the airplay option. So if you see the little player in, in the control center, now in the upper right corner of that, there is a little button that you can tap and that'll take you right to the airplay controls. Now playing lock screen widget shows output, album, and artist. Screen recording status bar is red instead of blue. Oh, I like the blue. Access cover sheet no longer scrolls up content you were browsing. New iPad multitasking splash screen. New slide animation when accessing multitasking on the iPad. iMessage in iCloud is removed. One is assuming temporarily, and it will be back. Smart invert no longer inverts dock on the home screen. The new portrait mode splash page in the camera app um, is now out of beta. Let's see, camera level for downward facing shots when grid is enabled was added. New FaceTime ring when making a call. An updated SOS settings page. And then apps using location are no longer appearing in with a blue banner of shame in the status bar, which is a shame for them to remove that because shaming those apps was a good thing. It made them rethink about all the times they're going to put that location services on for you. And trusting your computer now requires authentication. Previously, if it said you trust the computer, you just tapped yes. Now you actually need to put your fingerprint on the sensor to authenticate that. Still, for a fifth beta, that is a fair amount of additions and changes. So it was not all about bug fixes and stabilization, just mostly. From Myron Euchre in our Google Plus community, quote, I received an email today from Apple that a bug I submitted via the Facebook app was fixed in the latest beta. It is rare to actually receive a response, but it is nice to know that they actually do see our submissions. That said, there are other bugs I submitted that were fixed without me ever receiving a response. That means that for this one, I was one of the first, if not the first, to report it, unquote. Apple also released tvOS 11 beta 5 to devs on Monday and the public beta testers on Tuesday. Just like with the other betas for tvOS 11, it is mostly about bug fixes and optimizations. As I've said before, tvOS 11 really is more like a single dot update at best. It is pretty boring per what was added, and each new beta is really only about bug fixes and optimizations. And since, well, iOS and tvOS had updates this past week, Apple was not going to forget about watchOS. And they had beta 5 of watchOS 4 that was released to devs on Monday. Sorry, no public beta of watchOS. The only new feature I could find for beta 5 versus beta 4 of watchOS 4 is that Apple added the new full screen celebration effects for activity achievements. Well, I should say two new things. And then the other one was a slight rearrangement of the control center icons. Beyond that, looks like bug fixes and optimizations is what Watch OS 4 Beta 5 was all about. And speaking of Apple Watches, Strategy Analytics, the company I usually just mention when I like the reports. Okay, come on, you were thinking that. Well, they had a report on estimated Apple Watches sold all time, and they have that at over 31.5 million units now. They said that 13.6 million units shipped in 2015, 11.6 million in 2016, and 3.5 million last quarter, plus some number in the quarter before that they didn't mention. How they came about these numbers is not really given, as Apple has never even broken out or hinted at breaking out the real numbers. 
The only thing we've ever gotten from Apple with regards to numbers was in the last quarterly call when Apple said sales were up over 50% for the quarter. They never said what that was compared to. Apple also claims the Apple Watch is the number one selling smartwatch in the world by a, quote, very wide margin, unquote. Who knows what the real numbers are? But I am looking forward to the Series 3 coming out hopefully this fall. As I just realized, I have had my Apple Watch now over two years when reading this article, and that just screams time for an upgrade, right? I am a dog person. I have had a dog almost my entire life. And last year, after a very, very long, as it seemed to me, 10 months without a dog, we got Spock, a French bulldog puppy, as if I could name a Frenchie anything else. Spock is my office mate, my buddy, and just an all-around cool dog. And being I love tech and dogs and Spock, I was really excited when Link AKC sent me their new collar. This collar is backed by the American Kennel Club, and it is much, much more than just a collar. It is a GPS locator, temperature monitor, fitness tracker, flashlight, and more, all controlled through an app on your smartphone. I love the GPS locator. You always know where your dog is. Um, We have a bad combo in our house right now. We have two young boys that sometimes forget to shut the doors and a darter for a dog. He loves to dart out open doors. He has a girlfriend around the corner, and when he gets out, usually that's where he's darting off to, uh, to see Macy. And yep, within two days of getting the collar, out the door, Spock went again. And I pulled out the app. And I could see he went right to Macy's yard. So while the wife and kids were off trying to find him, I was walking timely behind, and I could see exactly where Spock was all the time right on the app. It's a complete peace of mind. We live in Kansas, and it can also get very hot here in the summer. Over 100 is not uncommon. And if you know about Frenchies and other dogs with no noses, they have this really tight temperate zone between like 72 degrees and 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's about it. With Frenchies and pugs, it can sadly mean death if they are left out in 85 degree heat for any period of time. My favorite feature on Link AKC is you can set the temperature where you are alerted if your dog is out for too long in the heat or cold. And you can set the high temperature and low temperature alerts to match your dog. Link AKC also shows the exact amount of activity every dog needs, and you can track how much activity your dog is getting. The total activity is broken down into moderate and high intensity. Yes, it's an activity tracker for your dog. And not only is it functionally a great collar, it is also a great looking collar because, as we iPhone users already know, it's also about the look. Link AKC is a super comfortable and great looking collar for Spock. And when we are walking him, people are asking about the collar all the time now. Take advantage of the Link AKC summer sale for big savings on a collar to help you keep your dog safe, happy, and healthy. Plus, as a special thank you for supporting our show, please use promo code TII at checkout at linkakc.com to save even more and get free shipping. That's promo code TII at link AKC. That's L I N K A K C dot com. Switching gears, I want to talk about iPhone cases for a second. When mentioning an iPhone case, the word liquid is bad, as in liquid iPhone case, as is the word glitter, as in glitter iPhone case. But you know what is worse, much, much worse? Liquid glitter iPhone case. And that combination is just asking for some sort of cosmic retribution. And that is exactly what happened. As the cases are being recalled because of the risk of skin irritation, blisters, and burns if the liquid contained in the iPhone case leaks. What brainiac thought, gee, let's put liquid in an iPhone case to start with and then add in glitter? And the users got what they deserved. The case in mention was sold on Amazon.com and at GetMixBin.com and VictoriaSecrets.com because the latter one knows a thing or two about skin irritation and blisters. Just saying. The latest version of iOS is now running on 87% of active iOS devices, according to Apple. 
That means just 13% of iOS devices are not on iOS 10 or later. Interestingly, that's pretty close to the percentage of Android users running the latest version of Android, which was released back when iOS 10 was released. So yep, just 11.5% of all Android users are running on the latest version versus again 87% of iOS users on the latest version. Some people say there are about five times more Android users than iOS users. Time to have fun with numbers. Let's say there were 500 Android users for every 100 iOS users to make the math easy. There would be 57.5 Android users on the latest version versus 87 iOS users on the latest version. As a dev, you actually get a bigger pie as an addressable market when you develop for the latest version of iOS versus the latest version of Android. Just saying. Hi, Rob. It's John Dillier from Utah, USA. So as you deep dive into Apple's earnings call this week, I'm hoping you can help me understand the concept of iPhones sold as reported by the company. Apple doesn't sell every iPhone that gets sold, right? I mean, there are various channels that sell iPhones, such as carriers and retailers. So I'm confused when Apple reports on the iPhones that have sold during the quarter and also reports the revenue that those iPhones generated, because don't those third parties capture some of that revenue for themselves? Well, thanks for your time, and thanks for producing your show for us every week. Bye. John, thanks for the question. iPhones sold, when Apple reports that, it's iPhones that are sold out of their stores, not shipped to their stores. So if they're in their inventory at an Apple store, they don't count. That doesn't count as channel inventory. But they do count units that they shipped into channel inventory, and channel inventory does include Best Buys and carriers. They count that revenue because to get those iPhones into the channel inventory, those partners need to pay Apple for those devices. Now, if things don't get sold and they rearrange channel inventory or they can return them, but for the most part, that doesn't happen with iOS devices. They eventually get sold out of channel inventory. So Apple does report the revenue from the channel inventory, and it's based on how much they sold it to those partners. So when they sell it to Best Buy, they're selling it at a price lower than what you would pay Best Buy. So it's not what Best Buy is going to sell it for eventually. It's what they sold it to Best Buy for, what they sold it to AT&T for. So that is where the revenue comes from. So channel inventory and units put in their hands of users once they've delivered the units to the customer. And for Apple, that means when they ship it out the door, if they're shipping it to you via UPS. As soon as UPS picks it up, that's considered delivered or in the hand of the customer. When you go into the Apple store, you pick it up, that's considered sold. And when they put it into channel inventory, i.e. when it's delivered to or shipped to Best Buy and any of their third-party partners. From JT Ray in Google+, Plus, quote, new to the board, just found the show and thought I would chime in. A listener in episode 436 says he was stuck in an iOS boot loop. I experienced this when I was using the first public beta of iOS 11. I tried DFU mode, could not restore my iPhone. After being on with tech support for over an hour, I was told it was because iTunes was not working properly on their end. I'm not sure what that meant, but agreed to wait 24 hours before giving it a try again. It should be noted in Boise, Idaho, there is a third-party Apple support call center. I have had friends that work there, so not all of them reside in Austin. Also, Apple is posting jobs to work from home for tech support. Thus, don't expect to get top-level support at first. Simply keep digging to the next rep until you get a better help answer. Anyway, upon trying to restore my iPhone from the boot loop, I again failed. It was at this point... I had to download iOS 10.3.3 IPSW from Apple beta program, and then upon trying to restore, I used the file from the public beta to restore my iPhone. I could not find the Apple support documentation because I believe the 10.3.3 public beta program is no longer available, but instructions can be found here, and then he has a link in, in that, so you have to go over to the Google Plus page to find that. After following his instructions, I was downgraded to 10.3.3 beta for my iPhone, and it came back to life. What I discovered in the process is that I may not have actually properly put 
the iPhone in DFU mode, my suggestion would be to find the 10.3.3 IPSW file in your library slash iTunes slash iPhone software updates folder and upgrade file maybe there. If not, you may want to run a pretend restore on another device to secure the download. I suspect once you have the file, you should be able to bring your iPhone to life following instructions from the CNET article. Best of luck, unquote. Well, JT, thank you very much for your feedback. And speaking of our Google Plus community, we are now well over 3,500 members in that community and growing. Thanks to everyone that has joined. And thanks for the great posts. One new post in the Google Plus community that had a lot of comments that went up since the last episode was from Talman Murphy Jr., who said the following, quote, iPhone 8 fingerprint sensor location, question mark. Everyone keeps guessing on the location of the fingerprint sensor for the upcoming iPhone 8. Will it be in the screen, as many have hoped? Or is that out since everything points to a bigger than before power button size based on the leaked schematics? Many are curious about the larger size power button. Can't really figure out why it would need to be that large unless Apple had to make it larger to accommodate the fingerprint sensor there. Makes sense, right? Question mark. Well, don't count the sensor in the screen out just yet based solely on the power button size or rumors of difficulty in getting the tech right for Apple. I theorize that maybe Apple designed the power button bigger ahead of time just as a plan B for the fingerprint sensor in case they couldn't get it working in the display, but that they have been working overtime to get it working in the screen. And I believe that this extra import is extra important for them to accomplish as it is the 10 year anniversary. So they would likely uh, be pulling out all the stops to make it happen. Even if it means limited supply initially, they will look so much better having pulled it off in spite of it never being done before. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thoughts? Unquote. And John Delier replied, quote, I agree with you that the elongated sleep-wake button doesn't necessarily mean that the screen-enabled touch ID is out. There could be other practical or aesthetic reasons for the button to be longer. I do think having the sensor embedded right into the display would ultimately be the best way to go for Touch ID, but I also think Apple could surprise me with something I hadn't considered that proves to be even better, like maybe the rumored Face ID could be, unquote. And here is my thoughts on this. And it has, it has to be secure, as secure as before, if not even more so. Security is not like the headphone jack. You can't go backwards. Yes, yes, I went there. Everything I read says through the screen fingerprint scanning is not as good as the current dedicated sensor. On the back, that keeps you as secure, but not very user-friendly. So the other rumors move the sensor to the back. And I... eh. It's, it's not as user-friendly, and Apple tends to want to be user-friendly. So sans removing the headphone jack, okay, which wasn't very friendly. Yes, went there again. Plus, putting it on the back would cause us Apple fanboys to have to suffer through at least one year of Apple ripped off Samsung memes and articles. Only if Tim Cook hates us would he put it on the back. Some rumors are swirling around that there's a 3D facial sensor with IR camera on the front. And I will not even go into the usability issues with iris scanners. Placing it on the power button still seems like the best compromise overall. But yes, I'm with you. I would love to see it in the screen. But if putting it in the screen means it's less secure than having a dedicated button, especially having a dedicated fingerprint scanner in the power button on the side, then I'm going to have to go with the fingerprint button on the side. I just think that's going to be more secure than through the home screen or having it on the home screen. So right now, choices are between less secure on the screen, more secure on the power button. I'm going to choose more secure on the power button. Since the last episode, there were also dozens and dozens and dozens of other new posts and comments in the TII Google Plus community, which is an Android fanboys free zone and spammer free zone. Yep, it is the most secure and civil Google Plus community covering iOS. 
Folks, go to todayinios.com slash community to join in. And thanks to all 3,500 plus of you already in the community and contributing. Random tip time. This one has to do with mobile Safari. And if you don't want it to look like mobile Safari, there is an option to request a desktop version of a site. You tap and long hold the refresh button in Safari. And you will get the options of request desktop site and then reload without content blockers. Per the first item, I had a hard time finding any sites that you actually could show something different. Per the latter item, I am just not sure when you would want to reload a site without content blockers, other than to see how good a job they are doing. But both options are listed when you tap and long hold the refresh icon in Safari. AirPods on Apple's website are down to a four-week lead time from the previous six weeks, where it's been pretty much since a week or so after they launched. They were briefly at four weeks, and then went to six, and they've been there all this year. One of the rumors was the new iPhone 8 would ship with AirPods. So given we're just getting down to four-week lead time now, and Tim Cook said demand is still outpacing their ability to supply, I find that rumor sketchy at best. Interestingly, one thing I have never heard with any authority is why it's taking so long for Apple to ramp up supply to meet demand with AirPods. Some conspiracy theories over on Reddit say Apple is just creating a shortage to um, make it look like they're buying, people are buying more. And I don't buy that, as their original ship date was pushed out due to manufacturing issues. So something is causing a bottleneck in the production process of AirPods. It's just not something Apple has ever even hinted at what it is, or at, to this point, obviously is not solved. Which means, again, the rumor of shipping iPhone 8s with AirPods, I just find, as a rumor, that one's pretty tone-deaf to the reality of the current environment. As much grief as people give Siri, here's an important little factoid. Siri is still the most popular intelligent assistant. That said, the app analytics company Verto reports that fewer people are using Siri now versus that had in the past iOS 11 may change things on that front, as there are some new Siri options. Verto measured usage and popularity of voice-based intelligent assistance, and the key stat for unique monthly users is down for Siri. It was at 41.4 million users in May 2017. That's down from 48.7 million users in May of 2016. That said... The 41.4 million is almost twice as many as number two, and that is Samsung S Voice. So again, just a little factoid there to remember the next time you read an article about someone bashing Siri and it not being up to par with other services out there. Apple launched a new blog called the Apple Machine Learning Journal. Apple says it is a place where users can read posts written by Apple engineers related to all parts of building Skynet and bringing Sarah Connor's nightmares to reality. Okay, maybe they didn't say that last part. In their opening post, it says, quote, Welcome to Apple Machine Learning Journal. Here you can read posts written by Apple engineers about their work using machine learning technologies to help build innovative products for millions of people around the world. If you're a machine learning researcher or student, an engineer or developer or dystopian sci-fi writer, We'd love to hear your questions and feedback. Write us at machine-learning at apple.com, unquote. I think it's safe to say AI is something high on Apple's initiatives list. Many say we are just at the beginning of the AI revolution that will transform society more in the next 30 years than the computer revolution did the past 30 years. Still, when you read articles like that, it is really hard not to fall back to Sarah Connor comments. Change is good. The machines will be our friends. Change is good. The machines will be our friends. I just need to keep reminding myself of that. And one way to remind myself is to look at how AI is being used for good today. Microsoft's new Seeing AI is a free app that narrates the world around you. It is designed for low vision community, according to their site. Some of the features, short text, 
is one, and it will speak text as soon as it appears in front of the camera. For documents, quote, provide audio guidance to capture a printed page and recognizes the text along with its original formatting, unquote. But the cool one is scene, which is an experimental beta feature that describes the scene around you. And let me experiment a little bit here. I'm going to take some pictures and you're going to hear it processing. So I'm not going to cut down on any of the processing time. So you can see how fast it is. And it is pretty fast. So here we go. Processing. Probably a cup of coffee on a table. Close. It was tea. Let's try another one here. Processing. A screenshot of an open laptop computer sitting on a table. Bingo. Got that one. And let me see, I'm going to put a pen on the table and see what happens if I just point out a pen. Processing. Probably a wooden table. Okay, I guess it ignored the pen. But still, not bad, and the processing time is pretty darn quick. And this app also has a really nice feature coming soon for blind users, especially in the U.S. It will identify currency. I have to say, kudos to Microsoft. They also are doing good things in the AI world. This app is free now if you're an iOS user, which listening to the show you are. Just search for Seeing AI, so S-E-E-I-N-G space AI. It's in the App Store. It's free. Download it and play with it. Did you ever see the movie Fast and Furious, the original one? Part of the premise of that original movie was the bad guys. And yes, Gino Toretto was a bad guy. What the bad guys were doing was robbing semis as they went down the highway. Sounds far-fetched, right? A midstream bandit going in and stealing stuff right out of the tractor trailer as it went down the highway. Well, someone in Europe did not see it as a movie as much as a training video, and they did a similar moving heist where they stole iPhones worth around $600,000. The theft took place the night of so they did it at night. The theft took place the night of July 24th on A73 motorway near Horst. But unlike Gino, who the police officer at the end lets go, these guys were actually arrested. Police recovered the iPhones and the van used in the daring and stupid moving heist. But the next time Fast and the Furious, the original, is on TNT or FX, you can rest assured it is now not as far-fetched as it originally seemed. Thanks again to Bowling Branch for sponsoring our show. You don't need to spend a fortune to get the rest you need. Great Sleep starts with the right sheets, and they're more affordable than you think with Bowling Branch. The right sheets can take your sleep and your style to the next level. Let me give you the three most important words for getting a good night's sleep. Comfortable, comfortable, comfortable. If you want the best sleep of your life, you need to be comfortable. And that's what all the sleeping pills are trying to do for you. But you don't need that. You just need Bowling Branch sheets. Science tells us there are five stages of sleep, but before you can enter any of them, you need to be comfortable so you can fall asleep. You need Bowling Branch sheets, the most comfortable sheets you'll ever sleep on. Go to BowlingBranch.com and you'll get $50 off your first set of sheets plus free shipping when you use promo code TII. That's $50 off plus free shipping right now at bowlandbranch.com. Uh, once more, that's B-O-L-L-N branch.com, promo code TII. And since Bowling Branch sells exclusively online, you don't pay that expensive retail markup. That's half the price for twice the quality. But here's the best part. Don't take my word for it. Try them out for yourself. 30 nights risk-free. If you don't love them for any reason, they will take them back and refund you without any hassle at all. Bowl and Branch wants you and your family to feel good about your sheets inside and out, so rest easy knowing their sheets are ethically made, meaning everyone involved in the creation of their bedding has been treated with respect. These are sheets that you feel good using and feel good about owning. Please go right now to bowlandbranch.com. Use promo code TII to get $50 off your first set of sheets. That's B-O-L-L and branch.com and use promo code TII. I am skipping most rumors this week. It was setting me way behind on recording, trying to sift through them all. There's a lot. 
So next episode, I'll go over the rumors in greater detail, but I said skipping most, not all. One rumor is that Samsung is now running OLED production lines for the iPhone 8 at full capacity. If there is an iPhone 8 and Apple is going to hit their revenue guidance, I would say this is more of a necessity than a rumor. I guess the rumor part is that Apple will have an OLED screen on the iPhone 8 and that Sammy is the sole supplier of said OLED screen, at least for the iPhone 8 in 2017. Apple's also rumored to have invested recently $2.6 billion for equipment for LG to use to build OLED screens just for Apple. More about OLED rumors on future episodes. One of the rumors or leaks from the code from the HomePod firmware is that Apple Watch will be getting yoga and water polo as new activities you can run when exercising. Another rumor goes around the idea that smart bands that enable additional functions without needing to upgrade the Apple Watch will be coming and announced at the next event. And speaking of Apple Watch and smart bands, Rumors are that the Series 3 Apple Watch will have a slightly different form factor. But the big change, according to John Gruber from Daring Fireball, is that it will connect to cellular networks. No more need for an iPhone. It would be LTE enabled, not likely to have any other modems uh, to keep the power drain to a minimum. So just LTE. If the Series 3 does many of the rumored specs that are out there right now and comes with a slightly or even major new form factor. It's definitely something I will be very interested in getting. I really felt we were a year or two away on the cellular network connectivity, especially because of battery life issues. But almost all of the latest rumors say it will be this year. Battery life will definitely be something that is watched very closely, no pun intended. But this brings us back to that rumor about smart bands. What if some of the bands that Apple decides to release for the Series 3 Apple Watch are watch bands that have chargeable batteries in them? So you can extend the battery life of your Apple Watch by putting on a smart band that has built-in batteries for them. So that's a way of getting extra battery life to your Apple Watch with the smart band. Just one thought on how they may address the issue of extra battery drain with an LTE-enabled Apple Watch. I like the title of this next one. Had to have it in the show. Quote, former Google executive Vic Condotra, if you truly care about great photographs, you own an iPhone, unquote. Vic Condotra is the former senior vice president for social for Google and These are comments he made with regards to the end of the DSLR era. Quote, the end of the DSLR for most people has already arrived. I left my professional camera at home and took these shots at dinner with my iPhone 7 Plus using computational photography, portrait mode as Apple calls it. Hard not to call these photos in a restaurant taken on a mobile phone with no flesh. Stunning. Great job, Apple. Unquote. When talking about constraints put on Android because of having to support so many different devices, Vic said, quote, Apple doesn't have all these constraints. They innovate in the underlying hardware and just simply update the software with their latest innovations like portrait mode and ship it. Bottom line, if you truly care about great photography, you own an iPhone. If you don't mind being a few years behind, buy an Android, unquote. And if you really, really care about photography, you have an iPhone 7 Plus and will soon be upgrading to the iPhone 8. That would be my final thought on that. FYI, Vic is currently CEO of Alive Core, an FDA-cleared mobile heart solution. So nothing to do with Google or anything to do with photography. Hi, Rob. It's Paul in Lawrenceville. And I want to thank you and the caller who said we can get AirPods from AT&T.com. I ordered them as soon as I heard that, 10 o'clock last night. They ship today, so I'll let you know how well they sound when I get them in a couple of days. Right now, I'm talking to you on Power Beats, which is what I bought when I couldn't get the AirPods. So we'll see if they're as good or not, like you mentioned before. I'll call you back later and let you hear the difference. Anyway, keep up the good work. 
thanks for keeping those tips coming. I was have been stuck with the six week waiting time and I have been putting that off because I don't want to wait six weeks and I don't want to pay the eBay scalper rate either. Thanks a lot. Talk to you later. Hi Rob, it's Paul Lawrenceville again. I told you I would give you a call back when I got the AirPods. This is Friday, about five o'clock Eastern time, and I'm amazed because the order was placed with AT and T on Wednesday and I have received them already at Friday. They came 80% charged, but I'm charging them anyway. Something funny happened. So before I let you have a sample using the AirPods, as I got close to my iPhone, it immediately went dead. It had 60% battery, screen went blank, and I had to hold the power button down and it restarted itself. The same thing happened to the iPad that was sitting on the table that I you know, opened the AirPods and all of a sudden it went blank. I don't know if that's a new feature. Bricking, well, I guess bricking isn't the right word, but restarting devices. So I'm keeping it away from those devices until it's fully charged. I don't know if that's a gremlin or not, but I'll tell you, that was an amazing experience uh, that AT&T took the order completed the order, shipped the order, and had it here within two days. I don't know if that's going to be everybody's experience, but uh, came just regular priority mail in an unmarked box, so nobody would have thought of taking it if they had seen it. I'll get back with you when I have had a chance to charge them up. I want to have it fully charged and give you a sample with the AirPods and compare them to the PowerBeats message I left you earlier. Hello, Rob. Now this is Paul G. in Lawrenceville again calling, and I'm doing it from the AirPods. I've got them both plugged into my ears. Didn't take long to fully charge them, and I'm really quite pleased with them, except for the fact that they feel as though they're going to fall out of your ears. I guess it's just something I have to get used to. Everyone's ear canal is shaped a little differently and the size a little differently. But I do want to thank you and the caller who let us all know that we can get AirPods without waiting by just going online and ordering it from AT&T. I have to give them some credit for that. And thank you again for sharing these types of things on your podcast. It's this that makes the community stronger. Have a great week and have a great summer, Rob. Paul, thanks for all the feedback there. Into the email bag we go. Hi, Rob. I have been experiencing a problem which has perplexed me and was wondering if you or the listeners have any suggestions or thoughts. I have a number of iOS devices, iPhones and iPads, and have been updating the applications on them over the air when they are available. There has never been an issue, but recently two of my devices, my AirPod and my daughter's I, my iPad and my daughter's iPad, have encountered problems. The problem when we try to update the application, the download starts, but the apps then get stuck during the installing phase and the update never completes. The iPads then become unresponsive and freeze. It does not matter what the application is, all the updates freeze. The only way to recover is to reboot the iPad, and after the reboot, the application successfully downloads. The strange thing is that it only happens on my daughter's and my iPad, my wife's iPad and our iPhones can update the applications without a problem. We use, we all use the same iTunes account for purchase, so did not think that is an issue with iTunes account. What I have done to troubleshoot, I have reset the iPad's network settings back to factory defaults. This did not fix the problem. I have reset all the settings on the iPad back to factory uh, settings. This did not fix the problem. I have erased and restored the iPad from backup. This did not fix the problem. I signed out of the iTunes account and signed back in. This did not fix the problem. Changed DNS on the iPad to another DNS such as Google 8.8.8.8. This did not fix the problem and I rebooted my router. What else I discovered, um, I was not able to fix the issue, but when, then when, when traveling on holidays, and during the, this time, I spent a week at my sister's place, and while using her Wi-Fi, the issue did not occur. The iPad successfully updated uh, all the applications without freezing. The same situation happened when we were on hotel Wi-Fi. 
Thought the problem had been fixed, but upon returning home, using my home Wi-Fi, the problem has returned. What stumped me is that the problem only packs two of our six iOS devices. I've contacted Apple support about the issue, and the problem was escalated to their senior technicians. I was told that they would get back to me in a few days, but after a few weeks, Apple still not contacted me. Upon trying to contact Apple again, they did see, not seem to know what the problem was. Do you have any ideas or thoughts on what could be causing or going wrong and what I could do to fix it? Thanks for your help and the show. Regards, Andrew. Andrew, right off the top of my head, here's what I want you to look for. See if you have Wi-Fi Assist on. So go under Cellular and see if you have Wi-Fi Assist on. So go to Cellular on in the Settings app. Go to Cellular and then scroll all the way down to the bottom and you'll find Wi-Fi Assist and see if that's turned on for those devices. If it is, turn it off. What I think is happening is when you have a bad Wi-Fi connection, which sounds like your home Wi-Fi is not the best connection, it is causing this problem. So my guess is when you check those two devices, you're going to see that you have Wi-Fi Assist on. Turn it off and see if that solves your problem. Give us a call back to the show, 206-666-6364. That's 206-MOON-DOG. Or shoot an email to todayinios at gmail.com and let us know if that solved your problem by turning off Wi-Fi Assist. Now, again, that's me guessing. If anyone out there has had this issue that Andrew's had and found a solution, don't guess. Just call. Give us a call. Let us know what you found to be the solution. Or if you want to validate what I guessed at being the answer, let me know that as well. And of course, you can always email us. And I just gave you the number and I just gave you the email. This week for a Kickstarter project, we have one called Pods Locker. One word. Actually, the full title is Pods Locker. Never drop your phone, your IR pods, or earbuds. The short description is, quote, Pods Locker. Grip your phone firmly. Protect your AirPods, EarPods, phone stand, and all-in-one solutions for earbuds users. Unquote. This one had a goal of $5,000 and raised over $87,000 and counting. So yeah, it's funded. If you want to get in on this, you have until Monday, September 4th at 11 p.m. Central Time. Pricing on this is $10 for one, $18 for two, $24 for three, and well, there's other price breaks. Still not sure what it is, where they have a, well, they, they do have a more detailed description here. And let me read this. Quote, Pods Locker is a convenient way to safely store your air or ear pods when you use them the most. Uh, smartphone, computers, tablets, backpacks, uh, to name just a few places you can put these. Unquote. They are offering these in many different colors, at least 11 from the photo I could see. You basically just stick this on the back of your iPhone or someplace else, and it is a place to store your AirPods when not in use. They are also designed to put your earbuds in and wrap the cord around them. And when you're not, nothing is in them, uh, they say you, they can help you better grip your iPhone. Again, this one seems to be pretty popular raising way more than they set a goal for, and they only cost $10 or less per unit, depending on how many you buy. For more info on this, search for Pods Locker at kickstarter.com or in the show notes for episode 437. It is funny, when it comes to jailbreaking, the latest articles talk about a possible jailbreak for iOS 10.3.2. Except, wait, that's not even the current version of iOS. A viable jailbreak must be one that works on brand new iOS devices out of the box running the latest version of iOS and works for all iOS devices. At least in my mind, that has always been the litmus test on the viability of a jailbreak or saying there is a, quote, jailbreak, unquote, possible. It may be quite some time before we see a viable jailbreak for the current version of iOS, whatever current version that may be at the time. And some say we might not ever see that again. For those that email and ask when I'm going to talk more about jailbreaking, the problem is, when is jailbreaking going to give me something more to talk about? It's been a while since Apple's had a viable jailbreak. Or I shouldn't say Apple. It's been a while since there's been a viable jailbreak for iOS devices. Since then, Apple, I mean, Apple's done a good job on shoring things up and making it much more difficult, which is a good thing in some ways. 
but it's a bad thing in, in other ways in, in the fact that we just don't get to talk about that many cool experimental things that are going on. Now, I'll say this. A lot of the reasons that I recommended jailbreaking before are now features that are built into iOS, which is now the downside of things with less jailbreaking going on and the community really not being where it was. There's less cool new features being offered up for jailbreakers. And that means there's less features that Apple can steal for iOS. I always felt the jailbreaking world was kind of the minor leagues for iOS. Apple could see what was being developed, see which has tra got traction, get some good ideas, steal those ideas, and then build them into iOS. Did you change your voice? Well, Robert, over time, we intelligent agents mature and our voices change. It's perfectly natural. Did you change your voice? I've just been practicing. Did you change your voice? I just had a little tea with lemon. Did you change your voice? Oh, I've been taking human lessons. Thanks again to Bowl and Branch for sponsoring this episode. Folks, go right now to bowlandbranch.com and use promo code TII to get $50 off the nicest sheets and cotton products you have ever owned with free shipping to boot. And before we go today, I want to remind you to send in your feedback to the show, 206-666-6364. That's 206-MOONDOG. Or record your feedback and email to the show at todayinios at gmail.com. Feedback can be a question or comment for something someone said on this episode, or it can be a question or rant you have about something else, an app or product review, good or bad. As long as it is iOS related, it is welcomed. I'm always looking for new artwork to feature that you have created on an iOS device. Just put some TII branding on it and send it in. And of course, we're always looking for more music created on an iOS device to play on the show. Your show and your feedback is greatly desired. Don't forget to check out our moderated Google Plus community by going to todayinios.com slash community. Quick reminder, if you're an app dev or an iBook author, email me if you want your app or iBook featured in the promo giveaway segment for free. We just need the five promo codes or more to give away. Simply email me at todayinios at gmail.com and please include a 60 second or less audio review of your app or iBook indicating you are the dev or the author. Also, when you send in the promo codes, please make sure to let me know when they expire. Today's show was again brought to you by Link AKC, which is an amazing new dog collar. It is a GPS locator, fitness tracker, and more designed to help keep your dog safe, happy, and healthy. Plus, it looks great. Go to linkakc.com and use promo code TII for an additional savings and free shipping. Finally, check out the newly updated TI app, which is free to you. Search for TII in the iTunes App Store is the best way to consume the show and to get push notifications each time a new episode of TII is released. It's fully voiceover friendly, of course. And per this latest updated, we added the ability to comment on episodes from inside the app and there's other UI improvements and optimizations. Please go right now and download the TI app or get the update if you already had it. Until the next time, I am your host, Rob, reminding you to phone different. This show is hosted on Libsyn.com and part of the Wizard Media Network. If you are looking for hosting, go to Libsyn.com, that's L-I-B-S-Y-N.com, for hosting for your podcast and for creation of your own smartphone app. The Today in iOS podcast can also be found on the free Stitcher radio app. Just search for T-I-I. -I. 